Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Know How is brought to you by Cashfly. Know How is dead. Long live Know How. It's a Twitch show where we build, bend, break, and upgrade. I am Father Robert Ballasair. And I'm Brian Burnett. Wait, what? 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 What happened? It's Cranky Hippo, folks. That's right. He is uh, slumming it after uh, <laughs> being up on his ivory Facebook tower, my friend. It's yeah. good to have you back, bro. It's good to be back. It's kind of scary how quickly everything felt the same again. Like right? nothing had changed. Yeah, like, like just you, you just went to the snack cabinet. You're like, okay, I'll have this and yeah. some coffee. Yeah, totally. There. Right? It just, it just feels... It's like an old shoe. It is. Or a slipper. Or pajamas that are way, way ragged. Ew. Okay, yeah, pretty yeah. much, which uh, is scary. Yeah, pretty good. <laughs> no, but, but okay, so you're back. Of course, we got to fill in the audience. This is going to be the last episode of Know How, what we're calling 3.0. Yeah. We'll be moving to Know How 4.0 next week with Megan mm-hmm. taking over. Pretty uh, cool. And I thought there's probably no better way to end 3.0 than by bringing back my bro. And I appreciate that. Um, I definitely didn't want to miss this. When you said that you were going to be doing one last episode, I you know, I had to come in and be there for my bro. It's been a while. <laughs> a long, long time. Now, we, we got to fill them in because you are, up to? you are working at Facebook. It's right? been a while since I've been back here. Um, yeah, I work at, at Facebook. Technically for a video company that only works for Facebook. It's, it's in-house video company. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. So it's basically, I do now at Facebook what I was doing here at Twit, but on a much larger scale. And for Mark. <laughs> uh, yeah. Oh, you mean Marky? Yeah, we're pretty close. <laughs> you now. call him M Dog, right? M Dog. Yeah, well, M Dog. I mean, I, I kind of have to be careful about what I say, but yeah, we're pretty tight. Now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, one of the things, I mean, of course, Facebook is awesome, but you've got a killer commute. I mean, oh man, it's that's almost okay. sounds like a deal breaker. That's what the motorcycle's for, ah, clearly. Uh-huh. I mean, splitting lanes in California is made for that. But yeah, it's kind of a killer commute. Uh, but you know what? It gave me a couple opportunities to stop by your place on the way through San that's Francisco. Right. That's so right. I was we hoping have- you do it more because you know we have turkey. That's true. That's and, the only reason why I'll stop by is if you guys are serving like decent grub. And I'm telling you, you could always bring turbs you know, which is his little corgi. You could bring turbs because we've got a dog at our house now. You know, they could they could <laughs> do the whole dog out thing, whatever they dogs play. Little dogs. doggy, well, yeah, dog stuff. Dog I don't. Dog. What have I missed? What have What have some of the projects? Because you know, once I was, wasn't wasn't doing projects, I wasn't going to check in and see what you guys were I, up to I or know, anything. I feel, I which I did. I totally watched some episodes. No, I mean, we've done Raspberry Pi episodes. We've done Arduino episodes. We've done a lot of 3D building. We've done you know straight up uh, Synology Madness. That's actually one of our more more popular series. Uh, and of course, networking. It, it's funny. Some of the most popular topics are the ones that we refresh every other year. Yeah, the um, network Synology stuff. Yeah. Which, thank you, by the way, I have a Synology yeah. NAS that you gave me, a four bay. I'm looking forward to playing with that. Yeah. So just so you know, that was completely approved by Synology because basically <laughs> how it works is if they have a review in it out to me and then they end of life it, uh-huh. it's like, well, you can have it now. Okay, so and it's like, good. It's okay that I said something. It's, it's all now good. that I think of it, it's all good. It's all good. <laughs> now, okay. We wanted to do something special for this last episode of Know How 3.0, so I thought, mm-hmm. why don't we go back through some of our favorite episodes, some of the favorite bits that we've done, because we've done a lot over the years, and uh, we both had input, we both took a look at, we, we've had a lot of content that we're proud of, but we picked out like about a dozen episodes and mm-hmm. cut them together in, into a couple of videos that could show some of the more fun things that we've done, things that show how Know How has treated science, how Know How has treated things like quadcopters and tech reviews, <laughs> and also how Know How has treated just weird, weird engineering problems. Yeah, yeah. It's not easy going back through the list of all the stuff that we did, but it was a lot of fun kind of seeing uh, what we had done, where we had mm-hmm. com- come to, and it wasn't until I stepped away from here that I realized actually how much I had learned. Yeah. Because yeah. 
I don't know, just being immersed in it every day. We were just doing fun projects and stuff. And then I kind of got outside of the twit bubble. And I and had, you realize that most people just do work. And we were, <laughs> right. we were like, hey, this would be fun. We I, should do this. Set that like, on fire. Not everybody just plays with Raspberry Pis and build those Arduino projects and has 3D printers and stuff. And then somehow I was able to take all that knowledge to somewhere else and, you know, apply all that stuff. So I have to thank you for all the network stuff that you've taught me and everything else. You're, you're, from what I understand, you are now Mr. Robot at Facebook. Uh, you, I, you were like overriding servers with thermostats. And I such. can never. Yeah, <laughs> I found a, a unsecured thermostat in one of the bathrooms, but we got to keep that on the down low until I got know, it. Get it hacked. Well, let's go ahead and get this moving with uh, the. Actually, this was the one that both of us came back to because it was a mixture of fun science and kind of disgusting. This was what happened when we wanted to test out a product which has been revamped. This is the phone soap. This is a UV cleaner. And the whole idea was to have some sort of product that could expose your phone to UV light, which will kill microorganisms, mm -hmm. uh, you know, every day, at the end of every day. Now, this is their newer one, which is a lot Ooh. larger, so it can fit the bigger phones, and it's aqua. Because aqua looks sexy. <laughs> right, because when you're cleaning your phone, you want it to look good, hey, right? Hey, hey, yeah. look, just because I want it clean doesn't mean I, I don't <laughs> want it sexy. I want it to be pretty. Yeah. So you put your phone in here, it exposes it to UV light on both sides. Uh -huh. And, uh, well, we wanted to know if it actually worked. So we devised a little bit of an experiment to both dazzle our audience with our imperfect knowledge of science experiments and Gross it out. to test whether or not the phone soap actually worked. We need to create something for the bacteria to grow on. We okay. have to be able to see it. That's why we have to encourage the growth because bacteria are really small. Right? <laughs> Wait, I can't see that? Yeah, I know. It's just, you can't. But, but it, they multiply quickly. They multiply incredibly quickly, especially if you give them the right temperature yeah. and the right kind of food, the right medium in which, they, in which they can grow. I learned that from the Martian. Right, exactly. Mm -hmm. So what we can do mm -hmm. is we can encourage the growth and then by looking at the colony at the shape the size the color how it's growing the form that it's growing you can figure out what kind of bacteria you it can is figure out what kind of bacteria it is because not all bacteria is harmful most bacteria is actually good right i mean we need them yeah. but we're, I mean, we're figuring that out now. some of them on the phone probably aren't that great so we're going to need a few things uh first of all uh we do need a hot plate because we're going to have to heat up the the broth mm -hmm. we're creating an, an agar broth that's going to be, it's going to gel and it's mm. going to become the growth medium. I know. It sounds delicious mm. <laughs> if you're a bacteria. Nom, 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 nom. Yeah. Uh, we're also going to need these. Now, these are, these are uh, petri, petri dishes, dishes right? Yeah. yeah, you've seen these before. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, one of the things to remember about this is don't open the bag unless you have to. This is actually a sterile bag. Uh, okay. okay. It, this is the key to doing an experiment like this. You want to keep everything as sterile as long as you don't want to contaminate your uh, specimen. Right, because the only thing we want growing in these things is the bacteria that we swab on it. If, yeah. if, if you contaminate it, it invalidates the entire experiment. So we're also going to need distilled water. Uh, distilled water is yeah. a special kind of water. This has been steam distilled. So right. what they've done is they heat it up until you, it starts to evaporate, right. right? It's boiling. And then they condense the steam back into water and that should give you really That takes out all the minerals and things like that? Minerals, there should be no organisms in there. It should be nice. This is what water. you would put in your radiator, right? Correct. In or instead of like tap water. Instead of tap water. <laughs> or like if you have a, um, one of the humidifier, an ultrasonic humidifier. Mm -hmm. If you've ever used one of those, you get that layer of Mineral, oh, yeah, crust. The crust yeah. That's, you would use this instead. Okay, that's that's what you would want. So, so I'm going to go ahead and put myself uh, a little like. Let's see, I only want to use about half of this, so I'm going to use about oh, I don't know, 175 milliliters of distilled water. It's like a recipe, right? <laughs> it sounds delicious. <laughs> this is good stuff. <laughs> and we're going to turn this on. Normally, I would pre-measure this, but in this case, I'm just going to eyeball this and use about half. Half of, of the bag. Of the agar, right. <laughs> Woo! For, <laughs> for the magic of TV. This is good yeah. stuff. You can go to the side mm. view here. There we go. Oh, Look that's like... That. You know what it reminds me of, actually? This is like the flavor packet in... <laughs> A tang or something like that. <laughs> no, like a cup of noodles. Mmm, <laughs> 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 doesn't that make you feel good? Okay, so now we're starting to boil. So yeah. go ahead and measure out a minute from now. Okay. Uh, that's when we should. We've you know, got tw it's twenty six thirty. Yeah, on so the like twenty seven thirty or so is okay. when we should start worrying about this. I'm probably gonna have to take the heat down because it's gonna boil over. 
<laughs> He's gone. Good job, man. Brian. Good job, Brian. <laughs> Good thing nothing ever goes wrong on this set. <laughs> I know. You lose. You lose. Let that continue to boil. So, what just happened? Well, it got. It, it just got too hot and it, it boiled. Right. Okay. Which is why I normally like that I have a one uh, one thousand milliliter flask. Yeah. But I didn't use it because it didn't look good on camera. It's okay, Padre. Don't worry. I'm gonna stir it. Yeah. We and, got and, this. And actually, one of the nice things about this kind of a heat. <laughs> well, okay. See, now you're doing that. Did I make it worse? You made it so worse. Uh, Jammer B. Uh, can we get a towel? <laughs> we need a towel. Everybody needs a towel. Oh, I'm gonna catch it. Don't worry. Hey, hey, you know what? That is that is delicious, nutritious, nutrient agar. So you I just don't, I don't you enjoy know. yourself a hot cup of that. <laughs> yeah. All right. Remember, we left off last week uh, making an absolute mess, making yeah. our petri dishes. Right. Uh, we boiled over some stuff. Yeah. We did. We were making the the agar, which we were gonna pour into petri dishes, so that we had some some sample trays. <laughs> right. And then you showed me, hey, look, you can buy it with it already in the petri dish. Right. right. Now, I, I actually I did cook up the rest of the agar. Oh, you did. Okay. I did. And so, as you can see, if you go to the overhead here, uh, Alex, um, I've got a set here uh, that I, I've I've used the other set, but. These are nice and clear. This is what we want to see. There is no scarring. There's no. There's nothing growing in these. They're absolutely clear, which tells me that okay, they haven't been contaminated. Mm -hmm. I did screw up a tiny bit. I capped these before it was was uh, down to about 30 degrees. The reason why you don't want to cap it earlier is because you get condensation. Now uh, we've got five here because we are going to need five. This one right here. Uh, this is our control. That's why it is primary control. There's nothing that's going to go in here. It's already sealed off with this tape. So it should remain like that. It should remain like this. If it doesn't, if something starts growing in here, then we know we're off. It means my agar was contaminated, and we need we need to basically start the experiment over again. Okay. Uh, but it should stay. It should, and I'm going to keep it with all the rest of the of the of the plates. Uh, but if something starts to grow in here, I have an issue. Right. Okay. okay. Now. Now we have to do the experiment. Now remember, our experiment, we wanted to find out whether or not this thing actually worked. Ah, this, that's our UV uh, This is the UV thing. bacteria killer Death Star thing. And oh, well, yeah, exactly. You're going to need some shades for this. prepared for science, Padre. Uh, the idea is you put your phone in here, you close it, the little light turns on, and now the UV lamps are on. It's supposed to kill like 99% of the bacteria in five minutes or so. Right. Uh, we want to give this some lead time, so we're going to start it off. Uh, I'm going to do a, a quick process, and I'm going to explain what I did. Okay. I'm going to take two of my plates here. These are going to be my control for the experiment. Right, because yeah. you're going to do one before and one after. Right, but I'm going to do two before and two after, just, oh, okay. just so I, I have a bit more uh, margin of error here, or smaller margin of error. Sure. Oh, I, I'm going to use these. These are sterile swabs. Basically, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get a nice sample, because I don't want any blooms to throw off uh, what my collection data is going to look like. So all I'm going to do is I'm going to open it really quickly, and I'm going to make a pattern. In this case, I'm going to do a Z with the swab. What I want is I want to have a predictable pattern of where that swab was so that I should, that's where I should see growth. If there's any growth, it's going to happen in that Z. Go ahead and run that video that shows some of the swabs that we did around the office. So we went ahead and we, we looked at some of the surfaces that uh, people... Some of the <laughs> yeah. grosser the, surfaces. The, the grosser surfaces. <laughs> I feel like this should have Jaws music underneath it. Exactly. Dun. Now, remember, you uh, so <laughs> dun, dun. you want to take a wide sampling. Dun, uh, you dun, you don't dun, want dun, any dun, singular dun, 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 bloom dun. of bacteria to, to throw off the results. Ew. Uh, so, you know, we got yeah, TriCaster, mic surfaces. Keyboards are notorious for being ridiculous. Yep. I think this is going to be bad. The the handle on the sink, because no one washes that handle. Mm -mm. And uh, People barely wash their hands. Yeah, people do barely wash their hands, and I think that... That's going to be a good source of bacteria. But again, they, they, those Leo's keyboards, desk. those are always gross. Now, there were a couple other places I also wanted to test that I thought might make for a good sample. So oh, no. I, I enlisted a couple of the no. people around the Twit Brick House. No. Uh, you know, we're going we're to compare some human bacteria. You know, what grows inside of you? And you use the same swab for all yeah, of Yeah, I actually did not change this. So that probably <laughs> contaminated the experiment. Jerk. Oh, God, Just a, a little bit. Um, but uh, yeah, we're going to get some good results oh. off that stuff. Uh, oh. We've been growing this for a week. Oh, there's some bad ones. There's in there. some bad ones in here. So huh. I'm, I'm gonna I'm wow. gonna start off with some of the not not so bad ones. All right. So this, if we okay. take a look, that's Josh's mouth. Okay. Which is you know that's actually yeah. that's there's you know, some stuff living in there, but it, you know yeah. it's not as dirty as his uh, his language. Well, especially when you compare it to Brian's ear. <laughs> 
So, <laughs> Josh's mouth, Brian's ear. And the, the impressive thing about this one is that this grew way faster than any of the other ones. Oh, yeah, this was like the first day. The first day. The first day it was, day like it was out. So... Uh, it you know uh, and we're going to talk a little bit later about how we identify these because th there's very there's a few things that you need to key on in you need to key on well are the colonies see these little blobs those are colonies of bacteria are they <laughs> linked are they waxy how big are they how high are they <laughs> they do look a little ear waxy they, oh, yeah. yeah so so we definitely have different kinds of bacteria growing in these two cultures <laughs> so there's a difference between the bacteria that grows in our excuse me in our mouths yeah. and in our ears. To be fair, no one else got their ear swabbed. No, so we have so no, we have no idea control if this, this is normal or if this is horrifyingly <laughs> disgusting. Okay. So let's take that apart. Uh, here's here's a little something something. What is this one? Oh yes. So this is where we eat. This is actually not bad. Get out. Uh, here's something. Um, Which one's this? Is this the toilet seat? Toilet seat. Oh, wow. Nothing. No. Nothing. You this could is, eat off of that You really could. <laughs> so, uh, again, I mean, that's something that they do every time. We and kind of suspected that. We though. suspected. Now, compare the toilet, wait, oh. we compare the toilet seat uh -huh. to this. What's that? That's the faucet. <laughs> so, evidently, we clean the toilet. We do not clean the faucet. Uh, now, you want to get really grossed out? Did we do the TriCaster? I can't remember. Um, or was it just my ear? Oh, dear God. <laughs> what is that? Where did these come okay, from? Okay, okay. Leo's keyboard. Oh, wow. And by the way, that's actually really good. Keyboards that's, are normally ridiculously... That's that's oh, not bad, actually. This one's the, where that's did that mold. one come from? That's mold, that's oh, okay. mold, that's mold. And so there's some bacteria, but by and far the worst is this. Which one is that? That's it? the TriCaster. Uh, yeah, I, I figured. <laughs> oh, oh it's, they're crawling all over the board. <laughs> 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 we okay, needed yeah. to know if there was bacterial growth on our phone before and after. Right. Because that's going to tell us whether or not this thing actually does what it says it does, which is killing bacteria. All right. Let's All right. find out. So let's find out. Now, what we needed is we needed the control, and right. then we needed the experimental sample. So let me show you the control first. This was actually surprising. So even beyond the hypothesis, that's not a lot. I mean, there is definitely bacterial growth on the phone. Mm -hmm. It took a long time for this to come out. This was like the, a five-day incubation before we started to see these. Yeah. And and we've got we've got at least I'm counting four different types of bacteria here. This kind of strigly one, those small colonies, these colonies that are a different color, and then this white waxy one. Hmm. Uh, and so that was that was the before. I, I honestly, I thought phones were going to be a whole lot more disgusting than well, this. Well, especially your phone, too. Now, I know. I haven't ever like. watched my phone. So, you want to see the actual experiment? Yes. Here are the experimental samples. Whoa. Believe it or not. It works. It works. These are totally clear. There's nothing growing here. I mean, I've got, I've got the scrapes. I can see the scrapes where From I... From the Q-tip. Where, yeah, where I dug in with the swab. But that's, yeah. that's pretty conclusive. Um, hmm. This thing... It does, does what it's, do supposed, it's to. supposed to do. Yeah, UV light does kill bacteria. Hmm. Yeah, so I mean, it's it's kind of a, a no-brainer, but it's always nice to see that the claims are actually right. I mean, we know UV, especially UVC, light kills bacteria and microorganisms, mm -hmm. but this is actually really well done. So again, if you go to the side view, this is the the newer version of the phone soap. They needed to make a newer version because phones have gotten a lot bigger since that episode. Yeah, uh, that and so this one does USB-C, it's got a USB port, it's got a, a cable on the side so you can have it in there overnight. Uh, n n n really the idea is put your phone in here overnight, plug it in so it can charge, mm -hmm. and then just close it. It'll do a five minute cycle, and after that, you're good to go. I was going to say, if you left it on all night, it, that's kind of overkill. That's so, yeah. really, five minutes is kind of overkill. Uh, yeah. uh, unless you've got some hardy bacteria, like the stuff we found on the TriCaster. <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, that's, so what if you just got a light that this uses and you shined it over the TriCaster? They have them. So you can okay. buy them. They, they're like sold as travel accessories. So you walk into a hotel room and you basically wand it. Well, you really shouldn't because it's bad for your eyes. Right. So you're supposed yeah. to like set it in the middle of the room Walk Turn it out. on the timer and walk well, out for five minutes. Okay. Uh, which I guess you could do. I, I could also just, like, do this, walk around and... No, don't do that. Don't <laughs> that do doesn't, that. Seem doesn't seem practical. It really doesn't seem practical. I do. I, I like that it will do phones and stuff, but now that I've, like, rewatched that episode and seen how <laughs> terrifying the world is, like, 
I want like a big version where I just step into it at the end of <laughs> the night and then <laughs> clean me. Yeah, and put then... you put on the goggles. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And just like turn around, <laughs> just kill everything. At least one that I'd stick in my ear. That your ear was bad, man. And do you know what I did with that petri dish? It's still at the brick it's house. It's still right? in the brick house because we <laughs> we had full reign of the basement and stuff. And as we were leaving, I had that, and I just. I hit it in the wall. I may have hit a few things in rafters and such. So <laughs> Some Easter eggs for yeah. future uh, inhabitants of the building. Well, you know, when I come back to Twit after getting back from Rome, mm-hmm. uh, we, you know, 10, 20 years, oh, yeah. uh, we're going to buy that building and we're going to move back in. I'm going to find all my old stuff. <laughs> Except the, the Petri dish that I put in there probably has crawled it's away like by it's this time. It's like gone to the other side of the brick house. Like, wait, mm-hmm. what? What? It's sentient. My baby? <laughs> My uh, son? Now that wasn't the only mm-hmm. science, which by the way, that was episodes 152, 153, and 154. Mm-hmm. But we also did a science fair episode where we, we were, uh, it was the season of the science fair. So we mm-hmm. wanted to show parents, here's some really easy science projects that you could do with your kids, they could submit. And we specifically wanted to do one around dry ice, because I love dry ice. And not just because you can make dry ice bombs. Well, I mean, of course that's what I think of, but I also like, uh, you know, witch's brew or whatever. Yeah. You see the, the smoke come out of your mug. Exactly. Just don't drink it. Or what if you wanted to simulate comets? <gasps> yeah, that yeah. was the whole point, huh? Yeah. So this Fun. comes from episode 188. This is me and the hippo playing with some dry ice. Anything with a huge temperature, temperature differential, you're going to ex- experience the, the Leyden frost effect. And dangerous enough to... to yes, use there's a reason why you're wearing gloves and glasses. glasses, and I'm now putting on my safety glasses. We are going to be dealing with dry ice. So dry ice is, that's actually frozen CO2. That's CO2 that gets down to Ooh. 78.5 degrees Celsius at one atmosphere of pressure. And what you get is you get a solid. Now, dry ice will sublimate. It does not go through a liquid. There is no liquid CO2 here. It's going to go directly. Air to solid? It's it's going to go from a solid directly into a gas. Wow. Which is is cool. Um, That's one of these phase changing things. But look what happens when I put dry ice into water. (laughs) Now, with the... uh, with the, the boiling temperature of this at minus 73, uh, 78.5 degrees Celsius, obviously this water, which is very close to boiling, it's like 90 degrees, mm-hmm. uh, it's, it, it, actually go back to the other, the other angle, I'm just doing this so they can see it. Uh, it should flash over. This is so much hotter than what is the boiling temperature, the phase change temperature of this dry ice, uh-huh. that this dry ice should turn into nothing almost immediately. But it doesn't because of the later later hosen effect. (laughs) Yeah, because of the sausage effect. No, (laughs) because of the laden frost effect. What's happening as is as that that uh, the water is making contact with the dry ice in there, it's evaporating the CO2. But the CO2 then forms sort of a protective barrier around the dry ice, (laughs) so that you don't get a, a massive amount of surface area that's making direct contact with with the water. So in, in what I get is I get CO2 coming off and that's what all that uh, that that nice little And the CO2 vapor. is heavier than the air around it so yeah, it just kind of floats exactly. down. Exactly. So take a, take a look at that. So notice how this the 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 vapor is hugging the the ground. That's cuz CO2 is a lot heavier than the air that we breathe. Uh, also this means that if you're going to be playing with with dry ice in your home Mm-hmm. Um, make sure that it's ventilated because you can actually build up a layer of CO2 at um, the floor and a floor, and it will just start rising. And oh, rise. yeah. So, yeah, that's don't, scary. Don't do that. And remember, you can't breathe CO2. Just ask Mark, Mark Watney. Oh, but, yeah, that's true. Yeah. But but <laughs> this this is the exact same effect. So even though we're talking about a huge difference of temperatures, one was incredibly hot. We had a 400 degree hot plate. We had a 200 degree pan. This we're dealing no no bad bad <laughs> Brian tempted tempted and you know, this we're dealing with minus seventy eight point five degree material uh, CO two mm-hmm. and eighty degree water so if I do this ooh that's cool uh, go ahead and go to that overhead oh okay sorry about that so if you look at the individual pieces look how they're see that like that one is streaming around it's right it's like propelling itself it's propelling itself because what's happening th- that's actually how a comet works that's awesome it, part of it is being exposed to the water and the gas is evaporating it creates a little jet and you get these little swirlies that is so cool Th- right this this is actually one of my favorite things to do with dry ice because it's uh especially if you see it in a controlled environment it just makes this awesome effect oh you just had to destroy it didn't you 
Oh, Why do you want to break it. all the cool things, Brian? <laughs> Why do I always have to break the smart people's things? But I mean, if, so if you ever wanted to show people what a comet looks like, this is a super easy way to do it. Now, the, what, what you want is this needs to be shallow enough because if it's too deep, what you're going to get is you're going to get that bubbling experiment that we right. just showed you. And this is just sitting like on top of the water. Exactly. This is sitting right on top of the water. And it just has enough. I mean, you can you can actually make out exactly what's doing what it's doing. You can look at the outgassing, and see how it's spinning because the CO two as it evaporates, it, it creates like a little thruster. That's cool. Yeah. So that yeah, like you can almost imagine this being like a little comet. Exactly. Exactly. Nice. Now the difference, of course, is the comet would be experiencing the wind, the solar wind from one direction. This is experiencing heat from all directions. Right. But uh, let's let's do some more. And the comet's traveling through the vacuum of space. You got your glasses on, right? Okay. I do, yes. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> More! I like that you asked me that as you <laughs> had pretty much already crumbled it over the plate. Cool. All right. Put this over the top. Turn on the light. Whoa, it's so spooky. Spooky. There we go. Cool. Go to the front view, Alex. Okay. And if I take my fan, put it on the top, nothing should happen. Nothing? Why would nothing happen? But, oh. It's kind of a mess, right? I mean, yeah. yeah I mean, right? not great. Can you kind of see it on this one? Or? Yeah, there's a, yeah, there's there's a, little, a little bit, bit of vortex, vortex but it's on. not a well defined vortex. There's a reason for that. Why is that? Because right now, the only way that it gets air is from the bottom, and it's kind of pulling it at chaotic angles. What you want in a vortex generator is you want a way to create opposite motion. Because I remember, I want this thing to be rotating in the same direction as my fan. And if you look at my fan, my fan is rotating like this. Right. Right? So I want to be able to make everything rotate like that. So I have to put a slit on this side of the box and on that side of the box. So here in the front, there in the back, and what it will do is, as it sucks in air, in air, it will just create that natural, that natural uh, turning motion. Okay, clever, okay. Padre. How, yeah. So, how are you going to just cut a hole with? We're box just going to cut a hole with uh, our super handy dandy box cutter. Um, the easiest way to do this is just to make a slit. You just want to make a slit cut up up one side and down the other. But you want them on opposite sides, mm -hmm. and you remember visualize the air mass turning the same way as as the uh, the, the fan. That makes because sense. Because otherwise you're working against the natural inclination of the fan to turn air. So I'm just going to cut in like this. Again, super high tech here. Super high. You, you don't even know, folks. Oh, wow, yeah. You don't, you don't even know. Look at that. Whew. Yeah. Look at that yeah. slit. Okay. There we go. All right, now if we put this thing up top. We get like a cryo chamber. Whoa. Whoa. Oh, there we go. <laughs> a lot coming out. So now out. we get, there's way more definition of the vortex. You can actually see what it's doing. That looks cool. Right? Ooh. And that the flashing is what's happening when there's enough vapor to, to really redirect the, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the light. Uh, you get that. that so what, and that's just by adding those little slits. So adding those slits on the side of the chamber really gets it turning. That's awesome. Yeah. And actually, we can change we can change how it does by moving this ellipse. See, now it's more centered. Oh uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Because if, if it's if it's at an off angle, it makes the vortex kind of twist, twist before it goes up and out. So that was definitely one of my favorite episodes. But I don't know if it was because I've been away for a while. But you talk a lot. You know, I, I've noticed that. I, I, I just kind of just keep going. There's medications to even me out, but I don't like taking them. No, obviously. I don't think you've ever <laughs> taken them. <laughs> ever, ever. Okay, so th those were some fun science episodes that we did. Science. We've done a lot over the years. Uh, again, you know, we've also done things with Raz Pies and Arduinos and mm -hmm. 3D printing. But some of the ones that we've done that were, that were closer to, to pure science, like when we were playing with the gallium, which is that element that can eat through aluminum. Yeah. That was, I mean, I love doing stuff like that. It has no practical application whatsoever, but it's nice seeing physical principles at work. Yeah, and it's, it's kind of neat to do those things because you can demonstrate them in a different way. You know, like when we're doing the Arduino projects and stuff, it's a lot of screenshots, it's like some yeah, video and yeah. stuff. But like when you have something like the, the, I mean, the dry ice is just fun to play with. Right. But it's just like such an instant like, oh, that's sweet. It's a vortex that you've made by just making some slits and stuff. And right, right. I mean, it's, it helps you think outside of the box, but you built the box. 
to yeah, do that. Yeah. Now, Alex, if you could be ready with, uh, with this title. Now, what I want to do before we, we kick off Know How into uh, you know, its next iteration is mm -hmm. there was one project that I always wanted to do, but they wouldn't let me do because of the insurance. And that is here I have a, uh, a vat of molten lead. And I didn't think you were actually going to bring that. I know, right? I, let's, let's go ahead and do this because I should be able to wet my hands slightly. And this is the same <laughs> effect that we just showed off in that video, the, the Leyden Frost effect. This is extremely dangerous, right? It's extremely dangerous. I mean, and, and like, the, like I said, we, we preheated this lead. It has to be hot enough. And uh, I have to make sure my hand is wet, so let me wet uh, it here. If this wasn't the last episode, there's no way you'd get away with it, right? right. In fact, the only reason why we're getting away with it right now is because it's pre-recorded. And, and nobody's home. here. Yeah, but <laughs> so if you can watch. See, so I've got this vat of, of lead. Here's my wet hand and... Oh, God. Oh, my God. Oh. See that? See? Wow. It, it totally works. It verifies that that physical principle wow. works. I... I can't even explain what just happened. You would have to see it to You'd believe it. You'd have to it. see it. You'd have to see it. But I mean, okay, that, that was just a little throwback. It shows that we are dedicated to doing science here at Know How. <laughs> That's all we do. That's all we do. <laughs> Fill okay. in the knowledge hole. Let's still. go ahead and get that lead off the table. Mm, Let's move on to the next gonna segment. That's going to be a mess for Burke. That's, uh, that's okay. <laughs> you know, Burke, clean it up. Now, there is one thing that we've done quite a lot, and that is quadcopters. Have, have you noticed? Oh, man. Padre, that, you got me into quadcopters with all the projects that we did on them. Multi-rotors. We've flown them. We've built them. We've, we've crashed them. Crashed we've them. We've had a them. lot of fun with these things. In fact, this is your original, right? This is uh, actually... Okay, so no, this is the 2.0 version of my... Uh, oh, that's right. Your original's in a tree somewhere. Well, story is that it fell out of the tree and somebody has retrieved it, but I have retrieved it. Um, but I haven't gotten that one uh, back yet. But I still hang on to this one because this is by far probably the, my favorite drone I've ever had. And it's right. just like so instant to turn it on, go fly it like when I came over today. We were bored because Alex <laughs> took a little while. But as he should, as he should. I'm but we went out in the out. parking lot, and it was you know <laughs> demolition derby. We, yeah. I mean, there, we have built drones that are faster, that are better, that are more capable. We have That's bought true. drones that do never great had fun. footage. But I mean, yeah, if you just want to bang around, nothing beats a nearly indestructible multi rotor. Well, we had game of drones in the sky. We did. <laughs> Now, speaking of Game of Drones, though, I did want to take a look at something new. This has never been done on Know How before, but you actually got the next version of a multi-rotor that Leo had before it ended up at the bottom of the ocean. <laughs> uh, tell me a little bit about uh, what you've got. Well, so I've been, since we've been playing with quadcopters, I've always been into video and I really wanted to get uh, one of the DJI Phantoms, mm. uh, which we did have for we a did. short amount of time Until, and yeah. you destroyed it, kind of. um, which then I realized I needed to take practicing seriously and how to fly it. Um, but basically when I started a new job, my first paycheck went to buying a DJI Mavic Air for fun. Did and, you uh, talk to your wife about that? She was cool with it, because yeah. it's going to pay for itself. Of course, they always do, right? But instead of just talking about it, I guess uh, I wanted to do a little review as kind of, you know, throwback to what we used to do, so let's check it out. Introducing the DJI Mavic Air. This is the most compact and competent drone from DJI at the moment. And why do I say that? Because even when it's unfolded, it only reaches about seven and a half inches wide. And along with the remote, there's some cool features for keeping everything compact, like integrated little joysticks that you then screw on after the fact. If you buy the Fly More package, you will get this nice little bag. It, the drone itself costs $800, which includes the remote. But if you get the Fly More, it's around $1,000. You'll get two extra batteries. You'll get extra extra props, some cables, a battery charging dock. And when I first got the Mavic Air, I couldn't quite put my finger on why I was so comfortable with it. And then I realized it's exactly the same size as the Sima X5C, which I've used to practice flying drones. The Mavic Air is capable of object avoidance due to cameras on the front, rear, and bottom. Uh, if you're flying side to side, you're definitely gonna be careful. One of my complaints of the drone is removing the SD card can be quite a pain. And I literally did use tweezers to try and get it out. As you can see from the bottom, there's some more sensors. The whole weight of the drone is about is under a pound, even with the battery included. And the battery is 2300 milliamps, which will give you about 20 minutes of flight time. And if you're using the charging dock like this, the charging dock will charge the one that has the most power first. That way you can get back into the air quickly and from a low charge to full charge takes about 30 to 45 minutes. Connecting your phone to the remote is simple. 
you can follow the DJI instructions and it'll connect itself to the drone. And then at that point, you can see from the perspective of the drone. If you've never flown a DJI before, you'll be presented with a lot of information. Try not to be overwhelmed. The important things to remember are the distance at the bottom, the height of the drone, and your camera settings. As you become more familiar with the drone, you should definitely drill through some of the more settings, kind of get an idea of all the capabilities that the drone has to offer, which if I tried to tell them all now, I wouldn't be able to. But focusing on some of the other specs of the drone, it has a three axis gimbal, which the 12 megapixel camera on the front is capable of doing 4K at 30 frames per second, 1080p at 60 frames per second, and just about every other resolution in between that you could possibly want. Doing slow motion videos is easy, and also the automation features really set the DJI drones apart, which the Mavic is capable of, like doing this uh, spherized world pullout, it's just a tap of a button onto the screen and then the drone will target you or whatever you want to target. And then preset quick shot will do, in this case, a boomerang, which comes out really cool and you don't have to touch the controls at all. Now, while in normal flight, you will have those autonomous uh, avoidance detection. If you flip the switch in the sport, that's automatically disabled, but you will be able to reach the top speed of 40 miles per hour, which is pretty quick uh, considering for the size of this drone. Now, while I would say this drone is nearly crash proof, um, there are definitely ways to crash it and it will take practice. So I wouldn't recommend this as your very first drone. Uh, you probably could get by, but you will never reach the limits of the drone unless you practice a lot with it. And I still highly recommend getting a cheaper drone to familiarize yourself with the controls. But once you've done that, you can really get some incredible shots um, with the DJI Mavic Air. And I am in love with it. The only complaints I have are battery life is a little short, but that's why I got a couple of extra batteries, which are easy enough to carry around. And the SD card is kind of a pain to get out, but I don't really pull it out very often. And finally, it is a little bit loud. Um, not loud in the sense that it makes a lot of noise, but it has kind of a high pitch to the frequency to the propeller. So you will still be able to hear the, the, the Mavic Air from a bit of a distance. Other than that, this is a fantastic drone. It's amazing how far the technology has come in such a short amount of time. If you've been waiting for a compact drone that you can throw in your backpack and take with you anywhere, this is definitely one to consider. It's my review of the DJI Mavic Air. So yeah, I've been uh, having a lot of fun with that. That's gorgeous. That's gorgeous. I mean, that, you know what I feel like? Mm -hmm. I feel like we went through that era, like at the start of the PC, mm -hmm. where everyone was building PCs because you could build something that was better than what you could buy. You could integrate it with more features than and what might cheaper. be off the shelf. And it was cheaper. And now it's like, no. You know, it's advanced to the point at which this is going to be more advanced, it's more capable than anything you're going to buy. The right. software is ready. It's proven. They've crashed so many times that they've been able to figure out what causes the crashes. Um, I mean, 800 bucks. I'm actually thinking about getting one of these. I wasn't before I saw you playing with this, before you brought this to San Francisco. <laughs> but now I'm looking at the footage going, it's not a toy anymore. I have yeah. toys. This is an actual production tool. Yeah, this has replaced um, a lot, like a lot of cameras that I would bring out with me. Otherwise, I just bring this, and it's so small and compact that I just throw it in my backpack. Ideally, what I got it for was I like to ride my motorcycle out to the coast, mm -hmm. and I just wanted to get like some shots and stuff while I and did that. And they were that. beautiful shots. And it was great for that. Um, and it, it's been terrific. Like you said, the so software has really caught up to the point where it's nearly foolproof. Like you can definitely throw it in sport mode. Mm -hmm. and it disables everything and if you've been practicing with a, like one of the smaller drones it's a lot of fun but if you throw in a sport mode and you don't know what you're doing yeah. you'll go straight into a wall or into the water or whatever um, but you did point out which uh, the charger will only That's charge so weird it is weird why I would think, you do that I think what it is is that um, the charger is meant to be pretty portable for the batteries, so you throw it into that bag, and I don't think it pushes enough power to charge all three okay. batteries at once. Okay. And the idea behind charging the battery that has the most life first, I think, is so gets that you back out into the field. It gets you back out. Possible. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And then the other two can sit or whatever. Yeah, and the fact that this could fold up, I could take this on an airplane, 
and that it is so small and gives me really good solid footage uh, I can't I mean I'll, I'll be the first to say I can't build anything that can take pictures like this no. I can still build one that will outperform it you know <laughs> yes. I, way outperform it but you know that's that's what I would use it for I would use this for the production work yeah. I would never use this in sport mode this would be the thing I take out because I want to get that shot for whatever event I'm at and then I would bust out one of my 250s or my mm -hmm. 150 and say, okay, now let's tear around the, the place and crash into a fence. Yeah, like if you want to do FPV and all that stuff, like I would totally do that. And it was so comfortable switching to this drone because it's the same size as the yeah. other drone, like right? the 250. Right, look at so. that, look at it, it's so cute. It almost has a little face. And I love the fact that they, they realized, you know what, we need some sort of mechanism that will protect the gimbal and the camera. Right. And That's I'm, well thought out, DJA. Thank you. Super impressed at how well it does in high wind, too. And right. Yeah. I, I've been flying in pretty gusty winds of lately, and it just looks rock solid. It's like having your own little helicopter or it's on like a, a rail or mm -hmm. a gimbal or, or, you know, a jib. That's it. Yeah. Like if it was on a jib. Yeah. Now, I love jibs and I love quadcopters that are on rails, but we actually had a lot of builds. We had mm -hmm. what, nine quadcopter builds on know-how over our, uh, our six-year run. <laughs> um, there was one that was just completely ridiculous. This is not something you'd be able to buy. It was something that was <laughs> ghetto from the start, and that was the little Octo Quad, which by Aww. now is actually just a quad because it's just, the top half it's is a gone. Octo Quad. Yeah. You may Poor remember this. It was a Hobby King, cha or Hobby, yeah, Hobby King challenge mm -hmm. to see how much you could lift. Now, it had to be a 250-class quadcopter, so it had to fit within there, but there was no limits on the number of rotors you could make. Right. Was there any limit on how tall it could be? No. Yeah. No. Okay. Well, I mean, it had to be 250, 250, 250, so ah. it could be a box. Okay. okay. So I may have ghettoized something, <laughs> and uh, here's both the win and the fail. Hello, I'm Father Robert Balliser, the Digital Jesuit, and this is my entry for the Hobby King Beer Lift 2015 in the uh, 250 class. Now, uh, this is my quadcopter right here. Oh, I'm sorry, my octocopter. I call it the uh, Yo Dog octocopter, as in Yo Dog, I heard you like flying, so I put a quadcopter on your quadcopter so you can fly while you fly. It's just two Diotone 250 frames that were purchased from Hobby King. And uh, for my beer, unfortunately I do live in a house of priests, so the beer was consumed rather quickly. So let's go ahead and measure my equivalent. Uh, you may have noticed that I have frozen it, but it is still, it is still refreshment. And I've got 3,850 grams worth of refreshment in, uh, in my quad. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Happy New Year! Woohoo! And keep it up for just some measure before we start to bring it down. And uh, Hobby King, for your consideration, that is my Yo Quad lifting up 3,850 grams. I'm Father Robert Ballas here, Padre SJ on Twitter.com. Peace. So what do you think, huh? Okay, three <laughs> they grams. They said it couldn't be they done, said, and that was amazing. We yeah. said three kilograms, and we actually did 3.85 kilograms. And for a little bit longer, too. Way longer like than said. the 10 seconds. Yeah. Now, uh, here was the thing. So I went to go ahead and post that on Hobby King's website, because that would have been the top. Right. And as I'm, I'm posting, I found out that someone had done 5,011 grams. I'm like, oh. But for how? No. For sustained? For sustained. For sustained 10 seconds. So I, I needed to up my game a little bit. Okay. Now, I, I do want to show you something. There, there wasn't a whole lot that I could, I could change uh, because I was kind of locked into the design. Right. This thing weighs, 
a, a good kilogram and a half just by itself. And the batteries are taking up a lot of that. The frames, unfortunately, were taking up a lot of that. So there was very little I could change except this. Mm -hmm. These were the props that I was running on that 3,000... Uh, a 3,850 3, gram lift. These are six by four by five, six by 4.5. So mm -hmm. six inches by 4.5 inches of pitch. Uh, pretty aggressive, but I didn't think I could get enough lift off of these to do a five kilogram lift. Okay. So what I had to do was I switched from these. So these are, again, these are from Ready to Fly. Yeah. Uh, I asked Paul Baxter, I said, what do you have that could increase my uh, my the draw on the capacity. motor, <laughs> and so he sent me these. These are bullnose, as you can see. These have these have a flat a flat edge. Uh, they're actually much thicker on the edges than than these props. Does that add to rigid oh, rigidity? Or? Well, it, it adds the amount of thrust ah, because you have okay. more surface area being uh, pushed through the air, so you're pushing more air down. Okay. This actually gave me about 10% more thrust at the same motor speed. Wow. It did draw a whole heck of a lot faster on the battery pack, I will say that. Okay. Because I could have I could have flown for probably a good minute with that load, with these props, mm -hmm. but the second I went over to these, I mean, I was down to 10 seconds, 20 seconds it of It sounds time. really mean, it's too. Really it's like really a hive of angry bees. And, and the other thing is, if you heard, if you listened to that, there was like a chirping. Yeah. Uh, that was actually one of the ESCs starting to let go. It was not... It wasn't happy with was that much very, power running through it, huh? Very not happy. Uh, so I, I did, I, I had four of those frozen water bottles for the 3,085. <laughs> now, why did you freeze them? Oh, this was a secret. And if people start doing this in the future, I will, I will claim that they, came, they got it from me. Yeah. One of the biggest problems you have is the weight sloshing. Yeah, and I mean, you did see a little bit of that it's, pendulum yeah, happening. Because the, the flight controller keeps trying to correct, and it, it, it causes really bad oscillation. But by freezing the water, you're adding one thing that's not sloshing back and forth. Right. Now, what I probably should have done is I should have given it a rigid connection to the quadcopter, to the octocopter, so that the weight itself wasn't sloshing. But it really did help. Because right. the first flight I ever did was with liquid water, and it was hell to try to hover. I mean, that, that was pretty stable. I stayed in one spot. Yeah. That was yeah. solid. I, it, the most difficult thing it looked like was takeoff, getting it to yes. center, and then landing. You have to go just a little off and then come down. With yeah. this system, I probably should have used longer rope. It's hard because you yeah. have to. It's hard. It's super, super sensitive. A tiny bit of throttle makes the thing want to jump. Right. But you had to get it over the weight and then start to lift because if you lift it off axis, what would happen was as you lifted it, it left the ground. It would swing out and pull it, and then you'd start this. Yeah. Then it's just like a death copter. It's a death <laughs> it's really, it's really, really unstable. Uh, but you want to see what happens when I try 5,000 grams? <laughs> because you wanted to win. You wanted, really you didn't want to come into second yeah. place. You wanted to win. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, hey, Alex, uh, let's go ahead and show them some fails. So that is 5,057 grams. Oh, 58, 5,058 grams. Oh, great. I'm collecting condensation. Uh, and I'm going to try to lift that with my, with my yo dog. Uh, oh, a couple things. I should mention that I am way out of my safe limits with this. This is way more than this was designed for, but we're going to try to do it nonetheless. Right, take the slack out. <laughs> that 
sad face at the end kills me. And, and that's why half is missing. <laughs> so we kept it. You and know, it's never coming back. It's never coming back, Aww. right? Oh, it was a good effort, though. It was a good effort, and you know, it was fun, and it was parts I already had. So it's not like all really all I lost was a frame. Right. But Everything was fine. What would you do differently to do if you were to do it? Again? I think okay. So a few things. First, I would cant it because the, the problem is I was identical frames on top of each other. I would mm -hmm. rotate one about. 90 degrees mm -hmm. uh, so that the rotors wouldn't be chopping up the same air. The problem is you had them one on top of the other. Yeah, and they, you were the basically, prop wash on it. You were feeding prop wash to the set below. The other thing, and I realized this later after looking at the video, is uh, because it was carrying so much weight and because I had it gunned to full throttle, mm -hmm. if you try to keep in the same spot as I was trying to do, you're creating all this turbulent air and you start to lose lift. Yeah. But if you'll notice, when I was moving, when I was moving the cargo, it stayed in the air because it was always finding fresh air, non-turbulent air. So it should have been me kind of like making a circuit. Right. But it's really hard to do that when you're holding <laughs> five kilograms of weight and swinging mm -hmm. it around. Well, my favorite part is when it goes off camera and you pretend like it's still no, up in the I air. Swear. Five, <laughs> six, seven. Oh, it's still there. Oh, man. I mean, that, that was the thing. Uh, like, uh, I didn't submit it. Because I'm like, uh -huh. I can't prove it was in the air. It was <laughs> off camera. It was um, a good effort. I should have had someone with me holding the camera, but I'm like, no, I can do this by myself. I know, well. And, and I was going to reshoot, but I had uh, ran out of props. Because <laughs> you a know lot, man. Two was, sets at a time. I was yeah. shattering two sets of props every time <laughs> I hit the ground. You got to go with the uh, carbon fiber or metal next time. Yeah, so it will shred people. That, <laughs> oh, would, be that fun. would be so dangerous. Oh, my goodness. Uh. All right, so let's go ahead and move away from quadcopters to mm. something that was kind of fun. Um, do you remember the time when we tried to turn you into a cranky cyborg? <laughs> you mean when the, one of the many times that you put my life at risk for the entertainment maybe, of people? Maybe you could have, yeah. might, might have let Yeah, I kind of remember that. Let's take a look. We have to talk about TECs, thermoelectric coolers. Now, right. again, you can go way back, it's like episode 70 or something, of know-how, and I was playing with TECs as TEGs, thermoelectric generators. Right. And the, the, the way the physics works is very simple. You apply heat on one side, you take away heat from the, another side, and you get current. And the original... Uh, the original application for this, was it cooling CPUs and stuff like that? Or? Yeah, we started using TECs. They were sort of exotic ways to cool CPUs when right. you were overclocking. We've kind of done away with that, and actually TECs tend to be more of a pain in the butt uh, because they, you know, if you don't do it properly, you get condensation. And they but now we will c cool humans. Now we, now we will cool humans. <laughs> uh, this is a solid state, if you go ahead and go to the overhead, Alex. This is a solid state device that uses what's called the Peltier effect to create a heat flux between two different materials. Now, this acts like a heat pump, pushing heat from one side of the element to the other. Now, remember what we said about heat. Mm -hmm. Heat's just energy, right? Yes. And I detect heat or coldness when there's a difference in the energy. Correct. So if your hand has more energy than my hand and I touch yours, my hand will feel hot uh, uh, to you, It will. Fe your hand will feel cold to me. Cause entropy? En right, because it's entropy. Energy is transferring from my hand to your hand. Right. What this allows us to do is to use current flowing through a positive-negative junction mm -hmm. between two, uh, dis uh, two dissimilar semiconductors to push heat from one side of this element to the other. Cool. Yeah, yeah. Now, the way that works is inside here, there's a bunch of little junctions. In fact, you, you can't really see them because if you look at most Peltiers, they, uh, they're they sealed off. They don't oh, actually to want protect you it. Right. right, right. Because those are actually kind of delicate. The, the, the box thing that you see in there, that's not actually the Peltier element. That's a ceramic coating on top of the two surfaces. Uh, uh, inside of there, yeah. I've got, I'm going to tell you where this number comes from later. There's, I've got 127, they look like little metallic blocks. And they're just two semiconductors that have been squished together with two ceramic pieces uh, glued awesome. onto the top. And that's going to allow me to push voltage through all 127 of those elements and act as my heat pump. When you're playing with these, the first thing you have to do is determine what's the hot side and what's the cold side. There's, there's supposed to be a standard. A lot of manufacturers don't adhere to the standard, so I never just count on the fact that they've done it right. <laughs> uh, we're going to provide a little bit of voltage. We're provide, actually, let's go ahead and take a measurement here. Go ahead and uh, use this. Okay. And uh, shoot that. So give me the, the surface temperature of of that. So it's a running about 76 degrees or 7. Oh, whoa, wait, Sorry, where I, are you going? I, I was trying to go. angle it towards the camera. All right, so 75. 75 degrees. Now, if I turn this on, if it starts getting hotter, it's the hot side. If mm -hmm. it starts getting colder, it's the cold side. So let me turn that on. And 
And this looks there like the we cold go. side. Okay, so this is going to start getting cold, cold. Actually, I think I got this thing down to freezing. And I'm only running 5 volts through this thing at the moment. This can handle 12 volts. That's getting cold fast. It's getting cold it's already fast. down to 50. And there's a fan on the other side of this heat sink that's taking the waste heat and pushing it away from the element. Oh, uh, okay. okay. What you can do is once you have this, you could go ahead and build yourself <laughs> something <laughs> like a, a killing machine. Like this this is my <laughs> cranky hippo killing machine. <laughs> When you think of local cooling, you need something to hold it against the part of the body that you're going to be yeah. locally cooling. So I came up with this death machine that we're right. going to strap onto your body in just a bit. Right. All the, the loose wires definitely instill confidence. Right? Right? Yeah. No, 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 these are so insulated. You're, you're yeah, we're totally good. Like totally good. 10% you're going to be okay. Wondering where that power supply came from. But before we plug this in and see how sparky we can make Cranky Hippo, hey Alex, why don't we go ahead and show them exactly how I built it. We're going to build an active Peltier cooler that will use a fan, heat sink, heat spreader, and gel reservoir to provide even cooling. I'm using an off-the-shelf multi-purpose gel pack, the kind you would use to cool an injured body part. I also found a cast-off heat sink, fan, and heat spreader at the bottom of my junk pile. I'm using a standard size 12-volt 6-amp TEC as my heat pump, and some Cooler Master Thermal Compound to make sure I get good contact with my heat surfaces. The first step is to mark off the shape of the Peltier cooler. We'll be cutting through the material to allow the cooler to contact both the heat sink and the heat spreader, and we can't have any fabric hindering that contact. Cut away the material, then test the size to make sure the element will fit through completely. You might notice that I've already marked the cool and hot side of my element, just as insurance to make sure that I won't accidentally flip my cooler. My heat sink and spreader is nothing more than an aluminum heat sink and a similarly sized aluminum plate that has bolt holes I drill to attach them both to a 5 volt fan. Spread a thin amount of heat sink compound on both the heat sink and the spreader. This will smooth out the gaps in the material to help create a more even contact with both sides. Now take the heat spreader and insert it into the gel pack holder. Line it up with the hole that you cut, then insert bolts through the fabric to which you can attach the heat sink and fan. Attach the Peltier cooler to the spreader through the hole in the holder Cool side down, making sure that there is no fabric between the cooler and the spreader. Gently push down and slide it around to settle the heat compound. Now take the heat sink and mount it on the bolts. Once it contacts the peltier, apply gentle pressure to distribute the heat compound. Don't push too hard or you'll break the cooler. Mount your fan and secure everything with washers and nuts. Insert the gel pack and now you're ready to wire up your cooler. Stronger. Stronger. <laughs> Fast. Okay, bionic. Sorry, Sorry, Vajay. I just get, I get a little crazy when I attach machinery to myself. What it was really designed for is to go in the oh, back, back of the head. head. Oh. And then this goes around your neck. <laughs> it strangles you. <laughs> yeah. But go ahead. I can try, try that. that. I can try, try that. that. Okay. okay. Try that. Oh, man. Oh. I've already got some. Oh, 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 wait, wait. Flip it over. Flip you, want over? The, you want the wires on, on that on side? On that side. There you go. There we right, go. Right. Of course. Okay. What, what was I thinking? Yeah. Let it choke you! Can you can you the, tie me in, Padre? Yeah. The, the choking means it's working. Ugh. And then see, we plug it in. So oh, it. guys, plug it in. Okay. So right now, the Peltier element is cooling the gel pack, and it's uh. exhausting the hot air out of the back of that fan. How does it feel? I feel very relaxed, actually. It's actually kind of cool, Do right? Do you feel six million dollars relaxed? No, not that. <laughs> certainly not that relaxed. <laughs> In our last cooling segment, we made a cooling belt using a gel pack, a Peltier cooler, and a 5-volt fan. It was the start of a functional device, but was limited because it wasn't portable, wasn't adjustable, and because the fan wasn't big enough to keep up with the heat being put out by the Peltier. This time, we want a fully portable unit with selectable cooling levels that can run indefinitely without saturating the heatsink. We're going to need a few things. First, I picked up a Turnigy brushed electronic speed controller. Combined with a servo tester, this allows us to adjust the amount of voltage that is being sent to the Peltier cooler. I also picked up a set of 3S 11.1 volt LiPo batteries to provide power to our cooling unit and a 12 volt fan to draw the heat from the Peltier's heatsink. Additionally, I needed two sets of XT60 connectors, two sets of JST connectors, an XT60Y cable, some 16 gauge or better silicone wire, heat shrink tubing, and four Velcro strips. The electrical design is simple. The batteries connect to a harness that supplies power to the 12 volt fan and the ESC. The ESC is controlled by the servo tester. Depending on the position of the tester, the ESC will send up to 11.1 volts to the Peltier cooler. 
This gives us control over the amount of heat that is being drawn out of our gel pack. I created a wiring harness, binding the XT60 to the ESC, black to black, red to red. I also gave myself an accessory connector after the ESC for later use. Finally, I added an XT60 connector for the Peltier leads coming out of the ESC and a JST connector coming from the harness before the ESC. These will be my detachable connectors to the Peltier and the 12 volt fan. Insulate everything with heat shrink tubing. We could stop there, just bind all the parts with some tape and be done with it, but that wouldn't be much fun. So I busted out a 3D printer. You can do the project without one, but we have one and I want to use it, so you're not my supervisor. I started with the fan on the belt. It's much larger than the original 5 volt unit that was bolted to the heatsink, so I needed an adapter. I created one in Tinkercad, a free online 3D design tool. It's a simple design big enough to mount the fan with an interior diameter small enough to mount the existing bolts. With the fan secured to the new adapter, I soldered the fan's leads to the wires I ran for the smaller 5 volt unit and insulated the joints with heat shrink tubing. This completes the upgrade to the gel pack. With a 12 volt fan, it should now have much more airflow, enough to remove the heat generated by the Peltier. The next challenge is to make the power unit portable and easy to control. Again, turning to Tinkercad, I created a project box big enough to house both batteries, the ESC, servo tester, and the wiring harness. I added slots to the bottom and top of the project box so that I could run Velcro fasteners through them and a wiring exit through the rear. A single hole through the front of the box would be where I attached the servo tester. I also made sure that there was a lip for the box, big enough to fit the lid. While the project box printed, I created a lid for the box. The design was simple. It consisted of two boxes stacked on top of each other. The top box was one millimeter high and the dimension of the outside of the project box, while the lower box was two millimeters high and the dimensions of the inside of the project box. We could stop there but I decided to add a little flair just for giggles. Now it's time for integration. I ran four sets of Velcro strips through the strap holes, Velcroed the batteries to the bottom of the project box, secured the wiring, and attached the servo tester with some hot glue. I made sure that the lid would fit to the top of the project box using a Dremel tool to grind down the edges that printed beyond the specs, then used the Velcro strips on the top to secure it. Time for testing. I connected the JST and XT60 connectors to the fan and Peltier, then cranked up the juice. The fan started spinning, and the pack started cooling as before, but this time it was portable, controllable, and padre-able. Once again, we could have stopped there, but what would be the fun in that? It's amazing how much better we got at doing the things we were doing as time went on, because that was relatively early. <laughs> yeah. And, and the project right before that was, remember the swamp cooler? It's like a bucket with a fan this. in it and some ice. Hey, we were keeping it simple. We were, we were working on our 3D modeling skills, which you've gotten a lot better at. Oh, God. <laughs> instead of just a box. This was the height of my 3D modeling back then. It's a box with some holes in it <laughs> and some hot glued LEDs. You got to start somewhere. <laughs> you do. You do. And, you know, it was a su success because I survived. So in my book, I you know, worked you, out. Do you want to give it another try? Ah, it still looks super It's janky. low voltage, super high current. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly what you want, right? Especially me, attached to your head. I wonder if they'll let me take this to Rome. I give it to the Holy Father and say, hey, you know, you, you want to stay cool in those summer days, right? <laughs> they don't have AC there, right? There's, how <laughs> else are you going to do it? Just put this under the, your little Pope hat. <laughs> <laughs> Is that what he has under there? I knew it. <laughs> it's an air conditioner. I, I designed it. Now, okay, one last bit before we say goodbye to the folks. And that is something that we've done on and off. People love Raspberry Pi projects. Specifically, they love whenever we do the Raspberry Pi, the retro Pi, the gaming The pie. MAME machines. The MAME machines. Yeah. So let's take a look at the last one that we did, an update to your original NES Raspberry Pi. I mean, I know, I know with the two and the three, Getting emulation running on those is as simple as download the image, have the right size flash drive, yeah. pop it on there, plug it in, and, and you're golden. Like, you're, you're going. Was it that easy with the one, or was oh, it a lot no, more complicated? No, no, no. 
like, yeah. It's like, it's like in the 50s, the episode of mm. the 50s of know how, uh, yeah. where you know, <laughs> there were so was. many it's steps because you, you had to get the, the yeah. image first and then you had to find the ROMs that you could add to the image. Yeah. And everything was a pain. And if you made one step wrong, yeah. it was easier just to go wipe the card, start over. I did it right. three or four times where I wiped yep. the card and did it. And uh, yeah, it was a lot harder to do. I took, like, I went back, uh, I think it was like episode. It was know how like episode 83. It was like one of the first projects mm -hmm. I did and the list of steps that I did, I was like, oh, this is ridiculous. Like, right. it, it was two pages long. And then I went, I was like, oh, well, I should make a new video for the update for like this episode that we're doing. And I was like, it's so easy now that I'm not yeah, even going to bother. It's it. like three steps now. But yeah, it was a lot harder. Updating was a pain. Um, I had to go into XML files to edit the, the data for the game so I knew which game was which. Hmm. So I put like, oh, I had to goodness. go find pictures for them them i had to like get the details the description all that stuff but like the raspberry pi one was powerful enough to do all the like nes super nes genesis and i put it into this uh nes case and if yeah, you go to this thing the is a product shop, by the way the people still <laughs> love this when it when they come by and they see this and you know they think oh it's just a decoration you tell them no it actually plays games it does and it, it plays does. more than just the yeah, NES exactly. game. <laughs> and, like, yeah, be, awesome. <laughs> looking back on it now, too, is so antiquated. Like, I'm like, well, why did we bother? We nowadays, put a piece of wood in there with super glue to hold things in place. Like, I mean, consider this. Consider where we are now in know-how. Back then, this is as good as we could do. This is only and three this years was, this ago. This is actually really good. I mean, you know, a lot of hot glue. A lot a, of a hot couple glue. Of different components. Today, it would be, well, we're going to custom solder our connectors, and we're going to 3D print a case. Exactly. We can do that now. And that's where we're going to get to. But yeah, uh, and for anyone who thinks that I sacrificed a working NES, no, yep. I did not. Yep. This was just a case that a friend gave me. There were no working parts inside of it. So, I mean, I do regret kind of cutting this part out for the HDMI power and Ethernet and then having to screw it in <laughs> to hold it here. And so it's just not not an elegant solution to... Yeah, but once the it. case is on top, yeah, you don't you know don't any know of that. Either. That's right. I mean, which it's fine. Oh, which and by the way, sometimes what you have to do is you have to take out the pie and you have to blow on it and put it back in. <laughs> Good. As it should yeah. be. My favorite part of this project though, or like the hardest part, the, the part that I'm most proud of was this little yeah. breakout board that hooked into the power and reset button, yep. which will... It was complicated because you don't want to just turn off the Pi. Right. You want, you want it, it to, to go back out to the menu. Is that You is want it? it to do a shutdown sequence. Oh. Yeah, but especially, oh, especially on this original, gotcha. if you just shut, up, shut it off, you had like a 50-50 chance that you were going to corrupt the storage. And uh -huh. if you corrupted the storage, you basically have yeah, to start, to start over. over. Yeah. yeah. So, so the power button, when you trigger it, it doesn't just cut power entirely. It initiates no. this the shutdown right. sequence. What does the reset button do? The reset sets uh, sends another signal that then tells the Raspberry Pi to just reset itself. Like it doesn't cut power or anything because that would be bad. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. This, yeah. This was an actual a special board that uh, he had to get in an assembly, which triggers the Pi uh, to the the kill. Mm -hmm. So it's basically shut down safely all the things and then disconnect power. I'm going to let the two of you talk about the intricacies of creating something like this. Um, I'm actually going to go over here. What? Just Where, you, you just what's oh, that behind you know, me? an arcade machine appeared behind oh, Brian that. there. Oh. Great. So Jason, what am I looking at here? Well, so okay, so uh, just to kind of back up a little bit, this is the arcade cabinet that Diami Palotki, um, a woodworker on the East Coast made for me. He actually hosts his own uh, woodworking podcast, by the way. It's called Modern Woodworking Podcast. Uh, so you should check that out if you like the design of it. He was basically running off of plans that Aaron uh, Newcomb had given. They're, they're posted on instructables.com. If you search for two-player bar top arcade machine, you'll find it there. This is so and then awesome. they were modified. So you can see in the middle, there's a, a little track ball. I felt like that was necessary because one of my all-time favorite games is Marble Madness. So you had to have the ball. Yeah, although that tacked on an additional almost hundred dollars to the project for just Whoa. the track ball. But Diami said I could totally make you know modify the the plans to make room for it mm -hmm. and everything. And I'm really happy I did that because it actually, what I've noticed is that the track ball is really good for driving games. Because uh, okay, yeah, in a driving game normally you'd have a steering wheel and it has variation of degrees, and you can mimic that with a track ball by rolling 
back and forth. So a little bit, and now you're turning a lot and all that kind of stuff uh, in a better way than you can with the hand, with just the normal sticks. Okay. And so not only is it good for trackball games, it's also very good oh. for racing games. That's neat. Yeah, because with, with my project, you know, I was just using an NES controller. So you're kind of limited to just a yeah. few console games. But right. With this, you've got the joystick, you've got the buttons. So I guess, I'm guessing like fighting games, you could do pretty well. Oh, this, yeah, because know. I got the, the, the six rows of buttons and mm -hmm. everything that usually maps out really well. Yeah. yeah. And uh, then you were saying that the the only downside is that I guess the speakers are on it, but you have to like adjust the volume from inside. Yeah, so you can see the speaker grills right there. On the inside in the back is where, so basically those speakers, and I think you, you had this in the little cut down, mm -hmm. those speakers were actually like desktop speakers uh, for a computer or whatever that Diami kind of extracted and, uh -huh. and uh, implanted into the back of that. So the little volume knob is kind of part of one of those speaker um, enclosures, and it's on the inside of the lid. Oh, so anytime okay. I want to turn up or down the volume, I have to take off the back lid. It's not the end of the world, but it'd be no. nice to have it embedded on the side right. or something like that. Well, what a I little thought, bit easily, more easily accessible. What I thought was smart with the back lid, though, that you, you or Diami did was with the magnetic, and so you don't mm -hmm. have to like unscrew anything. So you just push it up, yeah. and then it stays there. It's got a lip up on the top that you kind of slide it in, and then down to the bottom, as you set it in, the magnet grabs it. Pretty cool. Yeah. So since you've had this machine, what kind of... Have you done Moz? Have you yes. upgraded it? Yeah, so when I originally got it, I put in the Raspberry Pi 2. Mm. I want to say at the time that was the, the, the one. latest one. Yeah. And I ordered it and, you know, the, the turnaround for this, it took a while because Diami's got a life <laughs> <laughs> outside yeah. of making a free arcade cabinet for, right. for me. It that was crazy that he did so that. so nice, too. Oh, he did a fantastic job. I'm so honored that that he wanted to do that and it was really ah, great, no uh, that he did that but uh it had the raspberry <laughs> pie you're gonna be careful you don't move that off the, the oh counter. sorry no i'm just I'm just protecting my baby <laughs> He's um, excited it had the pi 2 inside initially right. and then the pi 3 happened and of course the pi 3 brings bluetooth support uh and wi-fi yeah. and it brings wi-fi support and you know updating things uh you we require an internet connection and kind of Plugging in Ethernet on this thing, where it's where I have it positioned at the at the house, mm -hmm. it doesn't have an Ethernet drop, right. so it just made sense. Like what, thirty five dollars, thirty five dollars yeah. to like to upgrade the computer, and right. what do you end up then with? Mm -hmm. Another Pi to do something else with. Exactly, and so when you upgrade it to the next Pi, did you have to change the image on the SD card? Or did you just pop it out and then put it in the new one, and you're good to go. I literally took the SD card out of the old one, put it in the new one, fired it up, and I was right back where I needed to be. It, oh, nice. it was seamless. Yeah, because I mean, the, the 2 is powerful enough to run a, all these arcade games. Mm -hmm. um, and really, the issues I've run into have been, it's more on the emulator side if a game doesn't run well. Like there's Star Fox that doesn't run very well right. because that yeah. required like an FX NES chip or whatever. Oh, man, I wish they'd figure that, that one out. I know, I love such a Star great game. Fox. Um, but what I've noticed with the 3 is that things are a lot more snappy. Like yeah. it, it is a pretty big jump from the 2 to the 3. So for $35, it's, if you're going to upgrade your, your system, that's not bad. <laughs> no, not bad at all. Um, especially when you consider that with the two, if I wanted to add Bluetooth support and I wanted to add Wi-Fi support, those are each, you know, ten, fifteen dollar little additions. Right. So right. then you add that up and it's kind of a no brainer. I might as well just get the new one. Mm -hmm. Then I've got a second one to do something fun with. What is it? I don't know. You know, <laughs> you, you can use your imagination and just come up with something neat because you've got an extra computer basically. You know, it's been fun looking through the 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 catalog of episodes that we have. Over 300 episodes that we did together yeah. over the course of our tenure at, at, uh, at Twit. And it's kind of amazing. I mean, everything from, from making arcade machines to doing science to making crazy lifting quadcopters, um, it's been a trip, man. Yeah, no, it was a lot of fun. I'll always cherish the memories. And hey, we got YouTube, so we can always go back and watch those. Exactly. <laughs> we can go back to, to see when, like, 
the early episodes, you looked so young. I was and just a kid. I the both the two of us. I looked exactly the same, man. <laughs> <I was> just, <laughs> that's true. You, you just, have I, not changed I at don't, all. That's just I don't weird. know if it's because you wear the same outfit. I think, it, well, it's this is literally this, the same shirt. I haven't washed the shirt since I started. The crazy thing is that shirt was white when it you was. started. It was. It was. It was actually a floral print. <laughs> but gross. <okay. laughs> no, no, it's been a lot of fun. Uh, I'm really glad I got like one more chance to kind of do this together and say goodbye kind of and... Yeah, you know, I knew that things would have to move forward eventually. As but, they always uh, do. We learned a lot. We had a lot of fun. I don't regret any of it, other than when you tried to kill me with the uh, the cooler. A couple of times, actually. Yeah. There were a few times. But we, I survived, yeah. so I guess better for it. It's all good. <laughs> no, but it's it's been a pleasure to have you as my co-host for most of my time uh, here in Know How. Yeah. Uh, I, I tell you, it's it's been an honor. You've traveled with me. We've gone around the world. Uh, you You became my bro. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's so much more fun to do a show when it's with someone that you just like to, to spend time with. Yeah. Uh, and that includes you. I mean, the audience of Know How has been wonderful. You've been supportive. You've come back week after week after week. Now, this is normally the time when we would do the spiel about going to... <laughs> follow on Twitter. Follow on Twitter and subscribe. follow some people. But you know yeah. all that stuff. You find me at Padre SJ. You find him at Cranky underscore Hippo. You find right. Alex at A-N-E-L-F-3. Couldn't do it without Excuse him. Excuse me, Padre. You got my name right. I know. What? That's amazing, right? Um, hey, we the last it. episode, you it's, got me right. I'm well, so, it was going to happen so eventually. I'm happy, Padre. I'm <laughs> happy now. Okay, that scares me. He should uh -oh. never be happy. Yeah, that's, right? That's like the end of the world. It's Something bad is going to happen. <laughs> but beyond that, it's been a pleasure to share this set with you and to, to share the cracking open of heads to dump in knowledge. That's right. Uh, folks, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for all your years of support of the show and of the network and of, and of both of us. And uh, you know what? Now that you know how, go do it. Hmm. So, hey Brian. Yeah. What do you want to do tonight? Same thing we do every night. Try and take over the world. Hmm. <laughs>